Well, this morning we are in Luke chapter 5, the first 11 verses. Luke chapter 5, the first 11 verses. Um, it should be helpful to mention every, every once in a while. I preach from the English Standard Version, so if yours sounds different, um, you should have a different version. Uh, but I'm in the English Standard Version, um, if you're following along. Also, as we look at Luke chapter 5, it's Jesus in a, in a small fishing boat with Simon and some others in the small business, the small fishing business. And over the years, years ago, there was some critique of, you know, how could this happen? They had small little boats. How could Jesus and Peter, all this stuff be happening? Well, decades ago, um, some archaeologists found um, uh, an actual full hole from this period around the Sea of Galilee. And for those of you who haven't updated your subscription to Biblical Archaeology Review, I'm going to tell you what that journal article said from 1988. It said that that those fishing boats were about 26 and a half feet long by seven and a half feet wide. So 26 and a half feet long by seven and a half feet wide. So these are plenty large enough for the, the hull of fish, for Peter and, and Jesus and others to be interacting. It actually gives us the context and the feel for the story, what's happening, how large these, uh, these fishing boats were. So hopefully that's helpful as we read the text this morning. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who are partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to us this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our story from Luke chapter 5 is a story of success. Uh, It's a a story, a narrative of success, an image of success. And that's really what the story is about. I want you to think for a second about your own life. What does success look like in your own life? How do you envision success in your own life, whether you're a student, whether you're having a career, whether you're retired, wherever you're at in life, how do you envision success? Is it accomplishment? Is it achievement? Is it just lack of adversity? John Wooden, the the former UCLA coach, basketball coach from the 70s, said he defined it as your best effort for best results that leads to peace of mind. Your best effort, best results that leads to peace. Is that success for you? And how do we define it? Who in our culture defines it? Is success in your life defined best by someone like Jeff Bezos of Amazon and Washington Post and others? Is it best defined by Bill Gates? Is it best defined by Warren Buffett, these kind of people? Warren Buffett's an interesting guy. If you think about it, Warren Buffett was born in 1930. What was happening in America 90 years ago? The Great Depression. A guy named Herbert was president. Herbie Hoover. Herbert Hoover in the Great Depression. The year after Warren Buffett was born, unemployment was near 20%, and the Dow Jones, I don't know if you've been tracking it, the Dow Jones was at 140 the year after Buffett was born. Those are some really bad times in 1930. I would venture to say it was worse than this year for most people. As a poor young boy in Omaha, Nebraska, Warren Buffett 
would walk miles in the summer heat at times to go to a local racetrack in Omaha, Nebraska, and he would get on his hands and knees in the sawdust-covered floors. And you know what he was doing? He was at these horse racing places. He was looking for lost racing gambling stubs. And maybe someone had dropped one that was a winner, and he could win. That's how desperate he was for money, for success. He was that poor. And you know, you know his story. He, he went off to college, uh, and in 1956, he had eight friends who invested a total of $105,000 in his new investing company called Buffett Partnership. Um, and later, he started buying a textile company named Berkshire. As of, that's how he started. As of last year, 2019, his net worth, according to all-knowing Google, almighty Google, Google told me this week on Wednesday that his net worth is $80.8 billion dollars. That's very impressive. I mean, that is incredible. But is that success? Is that a model for success in your life? Is that the standard of success? Is that a paradigm of success? This morning in our story, we're going to see two success stories. The first is with Christ. The second is with Simon Peter. And it's going to show us what biblically success looks like, what it looks like in our own lives. So if you look at the opening verses with me, this is early in Christ's ministry, very beginning, close to the beginning. He's not called any disciples yet. And it says the crowd was pressing in on Christ. They liked what he was saying. And he's near, as Luke says, this the lake of Gennesaret, also known by Matthew and Mark as the Sea of Galilee. Luke uses uh, the lake of Gennesaret because Gennesaret was the region or the district, like Charleston County or Dorchester County or Berkeley County. That was a district. And lake is what was used normally in the Old Testament by Hebrew writers. So what Luke is doing is he's using the district, the region, and he's using a Hebrew um, description of it compared to Matthew and Mark. And the crowd is there, and it says, this is the first use of this in, Mark, in uh, Luke's gospel, it says they are hungry, they are ready to hear the word of God. They are hungry to hear, quote, the word of God. First use of that in, in Luke's gospel. And just a subtle reminder, we should have an appetite for the word of God. We should be hungry for the word of God. Think of Matthew chapter 5, hunger and thirst for righteousness through the word. It's a good reminder. Are we hungry for the word being read, being preached, being studied? So the crowd is pressing in because they want the word of God. This is a large crowd. This is, this is the beginning of Christ's ministry. This is a successful ministry. Large crowds are gathering around this miracle worker from Nazareth. He's a charismatic teacher. Everyone likes him. And these large crowds are gathering in. And he was able to speak to large crowds. There was an um, archaeologist half century ago discovered, uh, actually it was more than that, a natural amphitheater in this region around the, the, the lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee, where the land naturally slopes down to the, to the sea. And some scientists from Israel in the 1970s went, and they did some, some experiments, and they found that a human voice just speaking from the lake could be heard by thousands because of the, the natural acoustics. So when it says here crowds are pressing in, it, who knows if this is where Christ was at this point, but at some point he was in this area and was able to speak to large groups, even a thousand or more people who are pressing in. This is, this is a successful ministry by our standards today. Christ has thousands of people who want to hear him and want to learn from him. And if, if we take that to 2020 in American Christianity or Western Christianity, if you get thousands to show up, you've got success. That's usually how we unfortunately define it. You've got a brand Honestly, you've got a mega church. You've got a following. You can build off this. You can, you can form a, a movement here with that kind of successful ministry. But notice what Christ does. He doesn't pursue a religious empire, building an empire. He doesn't build a brand. He doesn't do what many Christian leaders today would be tempted to do, which is capitalize on it. He doesn't do that. What does he do? What does success, here's the question really, what does success in Christ's ministry look like? And the answer is this, success for Christ means being faithful to God the Father. Success for Christ means being faithful to God the Father in His plan of redemption. And part of that plan is for Jesus to reconstitute His people, the people of God. The people of God had failed. The 12 tribes of Israel had failed. 
We see that throughout the Old Testament. We see that at the beginning of the New Testament. They don't want to hear him. So part of Christ's ministry is to reestablish the people of God, reconstitute the people of God, not with 12 tribes, but with 12 disciples who will be the foundation, Ephesians chapter 2, the foundation of the church, as Paul says. And so Christ is faithful to the ministry as opposed to building up this, this mega church on the Sea of Galilee. He says, I'm faithful. I've got to call these men to follow me. This is the plan that, that God the Father has established. And so success in Christ's ministry doesn't mean it's not quantifiable. He's not just looking at numbers. He's looking at what does it mean to be faithful to God the Father in his plan of redemption where I'm supposed to call disciples to reestablish my people. And so for Christ, there's a focus on faithfulness rather than results. Success is not defined by the numbers. He is calling these disciples to reconstitute his own people that had failed. And it begins with this fisherman named Simon Peter. Simon Peter and his brother Andrew have a small fishing business there in the region. That's what we learn here. Uh, Peter and Andrew Fishing, LLC. That's what they had. Uh, they're, they're gathering fish, they're selling fish. And as this, as this occurs in the text, they are near Christ, but they're probably not listening too much because they've been out all night fishing. They've caught nothing, Luke tells us. And now they're washing these expensive uh, linen trammel nets. And these nets, it was an expensive large net, a three-layered net. It's helpful to know the context here. And the outer layers were linen, the inner layer was a thin mesh where you would catch the fish. And what they would do is they'd throw the big net out, they'd get out on their 26 and a half by 7 and a half foot boats, as we know now, and they would make some noise and get some turbulence on the water and drive the fish into the net. They would go through the first layer, the linen layer, and then get caught in the mesh. That's how they would catch their fish. These are expensive nets. This is where all their capital is invested, is in these nets. And they would do it at night, because during the day, the fish are pretty stupid. We, let's say that, but fish know not to go into a net if they can see it, right? So during the day, they can see the net. At night, they can't, so they would fish at night. That's why they were fishing at night. But they've been fishing all night, and they have failed. Peter and, and Andrew and others have failed. And so they're cleaning their nets, these expensive nets, and thinking through their business, and maybe wondering, who knows how many bad days they had before that? Maybe wondering, is our small business on the verge of ruin? Maybe like a lot of Americans today, they're thinking, is my small business going to make it? Maybe they were thinking that, because they were out on the water all night. They got nothing. What if that happened the night before, or two nights before? I bet like many Americans, millions of Americans, Simon and others are sitting there thinking, our business model isn't working here. You know, we've got some questions. We've got some doubts. And that's what they're focused on as Christ leaves the crowd to get into this boat with Peter. And he says, hey, let's push out onto the lake. Let's push out onto the Sea of Galilee. Okay, all right, let's help, let's help this guy Jesus out. So they get in the boat, and Jesus tells Peter, you have to under, I want you to really grasp what's happening here. Jesus tells Peter, a small business owner, a veteran fisherman, he says essentially, this is my translation into the 21st century English, Peter, I know you're a professional. I know you were up all night fishing. I know you have no results. And I know you're, not, you're tired, you're worn out, and you don't fish during the day because the fish can see the net. How about we go fishing now that the sun is out and you're tired? That's essentially what he's telling Peter. A person from Peter's perspective who has no experience fishing. And so I want you to think, what was Peter thinking? Can you imagine the expression on his face when Christ says, yeah, just take those big, long, expensive nets you've just been cleaning, and let's, let's drop them in the water again. How do you think, think about for yourself, first of all, how would most of you respond? I know how I would respond. I know how some of you would respond as well. I don't think Peter was that excited about the idea. A guy, Peter's saying, a guy with no experience is telling me how to do my job better. How do you respond? No matter what field you're in, maybe you're in education, maybe you're in law, real estate, you're in a service industry, when someone who doesn't know your job comes and tells you how to do your job, how do you normally feel when that happens? I know how I feel when that happens. It doesn't go over real well. I'm guessing most of you don't like it. We don't enjoy that. I was thinking about it this week. I'm going to the dentist this week. And I like my dentist, actually. His his dad is, is our treasurer, and his mom is our bookkeeper. So we have a great relationship. Um, if I were sitting there on the, on the dentist's chair 
with the big light, and they give you the sunglasses. Um, and David came in, Dennis, and, and started working. I said, David, let's correct that technique a little bit. Let's, let's correct that on that molar. Let's do this. David, we, I know him well. He, he would look at me and probably turn the light on even brighter, take the sunglasses off, and say, Ben, shut it. Like, I'm doing my job, Ben. I would never think to tell him how to do that. I remember, this is several years ago, me and Charlie, when we were getting started planting the church and we had just started meeting and stuff like that, we had numerous people tell us how to plant a church. And some people were really helpful. And some people were not very helpful at all. And I remember we were at lunch one time, me, Charlie, and an anonymous person. And we were at, I forget what restaurant, on Shem Creek. And this person said, Ben, Charlie, you guys are doing a great job. Great job. You know, we're just really supportive. All right, that's great. Thanks. And then he proceeded to tell us all these things we should do differently. And they were really bad ideas. And it was the three of us. I remember looking across the table at Charlie. And Charlie was looking at me like, uh, what are we doing here? Um, what do we want to tell this guy? And I ended up being the bad cop, I guess. And I said, thanks for those ideas. Those aren't helpful. Uh, we're not going to do any of that stuff. So um, we got the check and we left. He was giving me some really bad ideas about how we should plant the church, what we should do, and, and none of it would be helpful. Trust me, if we were doing some of those ideas, a lot of you would not be here this morning. Um, but we, the, the idea here is that we don't like when people who have no experience tell us what to do. Christ, by all accounts from Peter's perspective, has no experience in the fishing industry and tells Peter, let's go to put the nets out. It's, it's bright, it's, you're tired, the sun's out, let's go fishing. And I bet Peter was thinking, you've got to be kidding me. This guy can't be serious. But notice what Peter does. Peter does, probably does not agree with what Christ says, but Peter obeys. And just because you disagree with something that God says doesn't mean you can't obey him. I don't think Peter liked what he heard, but he obeyed. And you can almost hear the skepticism in Peter's voice, the annoyance when he says, in response, he says, Master, a term only Luke uses in the New Testament. He says, we've worked hard all night with zero results. But if you say so, we'll do it. You can almost hear some reluctance and annoyance. But he, he obeys. And for Peter, faith in Christ overcomes his skepticism. It overcomes his pride. It overcomes his experience, knowing that when you're tired and fishing in, under the sun, it doesn't work. But faith in Christ overcomes that. Faith leads to fish. Look at verse 6. When they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking, and they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so they began to sink. So think about this. Imagine this. These experienced fishermen obey the voice of Christ, and they find the greatest catch of fish in their entire career. This miracle worker from Galilee, from Nazareth, seems to know something about fishing that he hasn't told us. And I want you to see two things this morning from this event with Peter. The first is this. When this happens, when they bring in this huge amount of fish, the first thing is that Peter recognizes the absolute power, the absolute holiness of the Son of God in his presence. Because as they're piling up the fish in the boats, and the boats are beginning to get lower and lower and lower into the water, what does Peter do? He's not bailing out water. He's not grabbing fish and chucking them onto the land. He's not doing any of that. What is he doing? He's really not being productive by our standards. He falls to his knees and says, quote, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Peter senses the holiness and the authority of Christ, and that takes precedent over keeping the ship, keeping the boat above the water. It, keeps, it takes precedent over uh, the, the fish and over keeping the boat on the water. And what Peter says here is he says, I can't even be in your presence. I know your holiness. I can't even be in your presence. That's similar to what we read from Isaiah 6 in our confession of sin. When Isaiah had that vision of God in the throne room 700 years before Christ, it didn't lead him to just start talking and say, oh, this is great. This is fantastic. And we're going to, it led him to silence because he realized his sin and he realized God's holiness. That's what Peter's having here. Have you experienced that? Where you know the holiness of God up here and your own sinfulness down here. Have you experienced that? Have you come to terms with that? The sense of God is perfect and holy without any sin. 
and you see yourself down here, not in the sense of beating yourself up and being depressed and just hating my life, but just seeing yourself not in light of how good you are, which is what our culture tells you to do, but in light of how good and perfect and holy God is. Have you seen yourself in that context with a higher view of God and a lower view of self, a biblical view of self? Peter sees that for the first time, and he says, Christ, you have to depart from me. Which, if you think about it, is a little awkward. Where's Christ going to go? The boat's only 26 and a half feet long. He can't really go anywhere. It's kind of an awkward moment. Peter, where am I going to go? But what Peter is saying is really not so much leave, but I can't be in your presence because I'm a sinner. You're a, a holy Savior. And Peter acknowledges he doesn't deserve the grace of Jesus Christ. And you and I don't deserve it. But we receive it because that is the definition of grace, that God chooses to do something for you that you cannot earn, that you cannot deserve. He knows the holiness and power of the triune God, and that leads to a healthy fear of God. That's what Peter shows us, a healthy fear. And that's why Christ says in verse 10, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Peter. Peter's terrified because he realizes something about this Jewish guy from Nazareth is not like any other person I've ever met. He's different. So Christ reassures him. He brings in peace and says, don't be afraid. You're, you're, we're going to go beyond fish. We're going to go to people. You're going to be catching people. The second and final point as we finish this morning is this. And this is a hard one to, to really receive. Peter and Andrew and James and John, when this occurred, they left everything to follow Christ. Verse 11, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Think about this. They have a small business, a small fishing business. Just 60 minutes earlier, maybe 90 minutes earlier, they were struggling. No fish, no profits, no money, not going to be doing much today with the business. Christ arrives, and an hour or two later, they've stumbled upon business success. The largest profits with the fish they've ever had. There's an opportunity here to franchise this method throughout Galilee and into Jerusalem and make a ton of money. They can make a lot of money off this fishing method if we just take this guy with us. We'll call our company Future Pope Fishing, LLC. Future Pope Fishing. He really wasn't a pope. Um, He was just a disciple. Another way to say this is this. Peter and Andrew and James and John are sitting on a financial jackpot they have the golden ticket, whatever, however you want to describe it. The biggest success of their career. I want to drive this point home. And listen to verse 11. They left everything and followed him. They left their family. They left their homes. They left their careers to follow him, to know him, to be faithful to Christ. So what did success mean for Peter here in the text? It meant walking away from money and a career and advancement, worldly success, to follow Christ. It meant literally valuing Christ over boatloads, in the literal sense, boatloads of fish and profits. Success meant following Christ instead of pursuing a career. And what you see here is that success for Peter was not defined by the standards of their culture, Success for Peter is not defined by the standards of our culture. Because just to be blunt, if my own opinion here, if that would have been Jeff Bezos or Warren Buffett or someone else, they would have capitalized on that. And that would be defined as success in our culture. Whereas the Bible would say that's failure. Because someday you're going to give it all up because it doesn't belong to you anyway. Read, read the book of Daniel. I used that in our prayer earlier. It's all his anyway. So why would you give it up? Success meant being faithful. And think about that in light of Scripture. Abraham, we think of Abraham as this great man, and he was. He left everything. He was a pagan moon worshiper. God called him, and he left left everything to follow the call of God. Think of Elijah, the great prophet of God. Elijah, at one point, as he's battling the prophets of Baal, thinks, I'm pretty much the only guy, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to be faithful even though I don't see a whole lot of clergy behind me to help with the whole Baal thing and the the fire from heaven. I think I'm the only guy, but I'm going to do it. Think about Jeremiah. 
Church tradition says that Jeremiah the prophet, he prophesied leading up to the exile, uh, the invasion, the exile from Babylon. He was successful, even as church tradition says, to the point of being sawed in half. That's what we think might have happened to him. And I don't think if he was being sawed in half, he was worried about his Roth IRA or his 401k. I don't think he was. Think about Daniel, the prophet Daniel. Success for him did not mean holding politically correct views when they said, yeah, you can't pray like that. If you do, you're going into a den with some hungry lions. I would try to negotiate that a little bit probably, just to be honest. That's confession. Can we negotiate this? Uh, He said, no, I'm going to keep praying. And he got thrown in the lion's den. Think about his three buddies. They did not follow the politically correct views of you should worship your leader, Nebuchadnezzar. And when you hear the music, when you hear all that, you got to. They didn't, and they were thrown into a fiery furnace. That's success for them. That's not success by American standards. That's success by being faithful. And you can think of others. Think of the prophet Amos. Amos was successful in his ministry to the point in Amos 7 where they say, shut up and go home. That's a great prophetic ministry, right? <laughs> we don't want to hear you. Because what you're saying doesn't go over well, so go home, Amos. Or Hosea. Uh, Yeah, you're going to need to marry a prostitute, Hosea. Uh, That's not a great plan, God, but I'm going to do it. And then finally, think about Habakkuk. Habakkuk is is a crazy little book. He's asking questions at the beginning of Habakkuk that never get answered. The violent, really mean that, really violent Babylonians are going to come in and destroy Jerusalem. And Habakkuk says that the fig tree will not blossom. The fruit will not be on the vines. The olive trees will fail, and the fields and the flocks will be cut off. But I'm still going to trust in the Lord. That was success. I mean, that's a a failed economy. No figs, no olives, no vines, no flocks, no fields. Um, That's like 1930s America, right? That's the Great Depression. And Habakkuk says, I'm going to be faithful. That's success. And, And for Peter and these men, success meant being faithful to what God had called them to do. Success for them was not defined by the culture, not defined by the politics or political correctness. It wasn't defined by their bank account or their brokerage account. It wasn't defined by most of the things that we are tempted to look to in 2020. And for you this morning, the Word of God says that success is defined by your faithfulness to the one who was faithful to the point of death on the cross for you. That success for you is not defined by... Any of those things, bank accounts, what you have, any of those things, the culture, it's will you be faithful to the one who is faithful to the point of being stripped and beaten, tortured, and nailed to a cross and died a violent death. He was faithful. He was faithful to the point of dying. And because of that, you can be faithful. Because the the Savior who was crucified and rose again, He gives you His Holy Spirit to apply the work of redemption to you so that you can be faithful. You can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. But the Holy Spirit does it through you. And that, that really is a liberating thought as we finish up. It, it means you don't have to worry about living for stuff. It means you don't have to worry about keeping up with your neighbors. You don't have to live for low country luxury or Mount Pleasant materialism. All those things are worthless at the end of the day. But you can live with an eternal perspective. And you can see your life through the lens of the cross, not through the lens of cash. It's liberating. It's freeing. Because you know that Christ has freed you from slavery to all those idols. You don't have to live for them. They're going to be gone anyway. And he died on your behalf to secure your position, your identity, your adoption to his family. And that that death is signified in in the bread and the juice. It's the gospel made visible. So we believe it, so we're encouraged in it so that we believe it and that we might share it. Let's pray.